Okay, welcome back. So we just calculated a scattering amplitude to one loop order, and we found that it depends on this parameter lambda, which is the cutoff in the momentum integral that we had to do. So because it's a cutoff, that means that we should take lambda to infinity. But what that means is the scattering amplitude to scatter together two particles, two phi particles, goes to infinity as we take lambda to infinity. And therefore, it is divergent. This is very problematic because a scattering amplitude is a probability, and it makes absolutely no sense for a probability to be infinity. Okay, so at this point, this looks really, really bad, and uh, you have a tempted to just go crazy and uh, and panic. Okay, this doesn't make any sense, so we should panic and give up on quantum field theory altogether. All right. Okay, so I will uh, give you some time to do this. To panic. Uh, take your time. You can pause the video if you'd like. But um, once we finish panicking, we should come back and um, and take a look at what actually happened. All right. So let's let's take a step back and examine some of the features of this calculation. Okay, so let me undo the panic. Okay, so first of all, something kind of interesting happened, right? In particular, we were trying to do a physics calculation. We were trying to do a physics problem. And um, when we did this physics problem, trying to calculate some mundane thing like a scattering amplitude, we found that we had to do an integral over arbitrarily high momentum. High, arbitrarily high momenta. Now, high momenta means um, small distances by quantum mechanics. So in other words, this problem is somehow probing very, very small, very, very, very microscopic physics. It's asking us to probe all of that stuff to answer our, our question. And this is a little bit weird, you know? Why should you have to know physics at the Planck scale, understand the structure of string theory, very, very small microscopic physics, just to scatter together two phi quanta, uh, this is a weird thing. You really sort of have some feeling that this shouldn't be necessary. You shouldn't need to know very, very small scale physics to understand how to scatter things together at, at long distances. Okay, so this is odd. All right. Uh, in a sense, this kind of thing doesn't happen in elementary physics normally. This might be the first time you encounter something like this in your, in your, in your physics career. And this is a sign that something odd is going on. Okay. Now let me uh, point out something related. So normally in physics, physics relates one observable quantity to another. It relates two observable things to each other. So let me give you an example. Uh, let's take, for example, the ideal gas law. Okay, so for example, PV equals to NKT. Uh, this is a great equation in physics. It relates two observable things, right? For example, take the temperature. Temperature is observable. If you make the temperature go up and you hold the volume fixed, then the pressure goes up. Everything here is observable. Okay, so that's nice. This is how physics should work. It should relate an observable thing to another observable thing. Okay, now is this calculation that we just did of the same nature? Well, let's see, what, what does it do? The calculation we just did in QFT relates the scattering amplitude I of M to the parameter lambda, okay? Is this a relationship between two observable things? Well, M is observable, it's a probability, it's a scattering amplitude. Is lambda observable? Actually, it's not, okay? Lambda is a parameter in a Lagrangian, and it is not a directly observable thing. So in other words, uh, to make this more clear, to make this more obvious, I'm going to call lambda not the coupling, but I'm going to call for a while lambda the bare coupling to make this completely obvious. Lambda is a bare coupling and is not immediately directly observable, okay? So the parameter, the infinity that we just observed, that we just found in our calculation, happens in relating an observable quantity, I m, to an unobservable quantity, lambda. 
a parameter in a Lagrangian. And therefore, there is no immediate reason to panic because we can't observe this infinity, this divergence. Okay? Rather, we should reorganize our calculation so it's more like the ideal gas law in that it relates an observable quantity to another observable quantity. So let's try to do that. Okay. So how do we replace lambda with something observable? What, what is observable, really? What do I mean by this? Well, you know, lambda is basically a, a strength of a coupling. We're trying to give lambda some sort of physical meaning. Okay, that's what we're trying to do right now. So how would we do that? We should be guided by real life. So in real life, if you wanted to measure lambda, you wanted to give lambda some physical meaning, probably what you would do is actually build an experiment, right? In other words, you'd go out there, you'd build some sort of physical particle accelerator and do an experiment and get some number. And then that number would be the value of lambda. So let's imagine doing that, okay? So let's go out there, build a particle accelerator. So build an experiment, okay? And scatter some particles. and observe some scattering amplitude and use that to define lambda. But when I say scatter some particles, I have to tell you at what kinematics, you know, what, what energies and momenta am I scattering them at? So let me imagine scattering them at S naught, T naught, and U naught, where this is a particular value of the Mandelstam variables that is convenient for me to do my scattering experiment at, okay? And then I'm going to measure the matrix element I m at that value of s naught, t naught, and u naught, and use that to define my physical coupling minus i lambda p. Okay, so lambda p is a physical coupling that I have defined in this very physical way by actually doing an experiment and using the observed number to define it. So lambda p is not the same thing as lambda. Lambda p is defined by this relation here. This thing here is really a definition. But we do know how it is related to the bare coupling lambda. In particular, we just did a calculation, a theoretical calculation of the scattering amplitude i m. From that theoretical calculation, we know how to relate lambda p to lambda we just plug it into our formula for I m from up above. And what we find is lambda p is related to lambda in the following way. Where here I am just transcribing the formula from above. And note, I am evaluating this at a particular kinematical point, S0, T0, and U0, okay? Because that is the value at which I define my physical coupling lambda p. Okay. So um, now we have a relationship between lambda p and lambda. Lambda p, of course, is observable because we defined it in an intrinsically observable way, and lambda p is not observable. But we can now solve for lambda in terms of lambda p using this relation. Now, you may be tempted at this point to try to solve this quadratic equation for lambda. You, you don't have to do that because we're working in perturbation theory, okay? This is only correct to lowest order in lambda anyway. And what that means is that there's a relationship between lambda p and lambda, which is something like this. You can read this off from there. And what that really means is that in the second term, it does not matter whether we use lambda or lambda p. They're, they're both correct to the same order. So in particular, it's quite easy to solve this for lambda as a function of lambda p. You can just immediately invert this relationship and find that lambda equals to lambda p plus 
lambda p squared over 32 pi squared times log lambda squared over s naught plus log lambda squared over t naught plus log lambda squared over u naught. Okay. So notice that the sign between the lambda p and lambda p squared is different from the sign here, the relative sign here. Um, if it's not immediately clear what I did here to derive this, I encourage you to pause and just take a step back and just verify this for yourself, that indeed these two formulas are exactly equivalent up to order lambda p cubed. It's really crucial here that lambda p is the same order as lambda. That makes it much easier to establish this relationship. Okay, so This is not clear, just pause the video and take a second and verify that this relationship here, the first one, implies the second relationship here. Okay. But now that we have the bare coupling lambda as a function of the physical observable coupling lambda p, we can now plug this in to the expression for the scattering amplitude. So plug in lambda as a function of lambda p into i m. If we do that, what's going to happen? Well, by construction, this dependence on the cutoff here is going to go away. And what we find is that I m as a function of s t and u equals 2 minus I lambda p plus lambda p squared I lambda p squared over 32 pi squared log of s naught over s plus log of t naught over t plus log of u naught over u. Oops, my head is in the way. So this is our final expression, which relates an observable quantity to another observable quantity, lambda p. And of course, there is no infinity in it. It is completely finite as you take capital lambda to infinity. Okay, so this is the point, okay? This process, what we just did, in which we took something and wrote an observable quantity in terms of another observable quantity, is called renormalization. And this is the right way to understand the infinities in quantum field theory. Okay. So notice renormalization is a really fancy word for the idea that you just write observable things in terms of other observable things. Okay. So let me take a step back now and just discuss what just happened. So just to reiterate this, we expressed our scattering amplitude I m in terms of observables As a result, the infinities went away. You will sometimes hear it said that we added the counters, added something to cancel the infinity. We're not really canceling the infinity, it really just went away all by itself. Okay? And that's the point. We didn't have to cancel it, it really just isn't there in the observable answer. However, there is still an infinity in the problem somewhere. The infinity is in the relationship. between the unobservable lambda and the physical lambda p. That equation does really have an infinity in it. The lambda is right there in that relationship. Okay. So thus, there is a sense where there is a divergence. There, so there exists an infinity in a parameter in the Lagrangian, which is lambda. Okay? So that infinity is really there, but it does not manifest in physical observables. Now, this did come at a cost. Okay, so what was the cost? The cost was 
we had to pick a kinematical point s naught t naught and u naught and use it to define our physical coupling okay I had to scatter together particles in a precise way and use that point to define what lambda p is. If you recall, we did that right over here. Okay. And um, in a sense, this is a loss of information, okay? Because from now on, we can only measure things relative to that point. Okay, so there's a sense where this is a loss of information. We only measure things. relative to that point. And if you think about it, we will have to do something like this for pretty much every divergence that happens. So every time we get an infinity in the problem, we'll have to do some sort of thing like this. Okay. But I claim it's not a huge cost because once you pay this cost, so once you specify this small piece of information, this bit of info, then you do have a lot of predictive power because you can measure the momentum dependence of the scattering amplitude. Okay. In other words, you can measure how the scattering amplitude IM depends on s, t, and u, which is now some non-trivial function, okay? So you have some non-trivial function that tells you how the scattering amplitude changes as you vary this away from the special point. So there's a lot of information in this theory, even though we did have to specify one number, we had to use this one point to define lambda p, okay? So there's still plenty of predictive power. Okay, so if you understand this, this is the point of renormalization. And now what we have to do next is to understand how to do this systematically. And we'll do that in the next lecture or in the next video.